And as you know, it's not always easy to see horses which are really lame or really showing problems in terms of uh, clinical evaluation for this uh, counter performance on a sport horse, which means that these horses most of the time are not always lame, but they always show enough discomfort or suddenly not be able to do the job they are supposed to do, which means jumping for jumpers, dressage, horses who suddenly lose scope and lose elevation when they work, and somehow horses which uh, in different disciplines cannot uh, pivot, uh, accelerate, push off the ground. And uh, in every discipline, like even in polo, for example, I know that horses could have this uh, low back pain and they will not accelerate the way you expect. You will not be able to catch the ball. That's part of the things that for me are called counter performance. So, when it comes to the problems, I will talk a bit about jumpers because this is what I do the most. But these show jumpers, for example, here is a horse who was very sound, but except that on the jump, if you look carefully, the, the video might be a bit slow for some guys, but look that on the video, the horse is going completely sideways. Here we do one more uh, clip to, so you can see. And you see when you have this impression of horses which are not jumping straight, or putting the leg on one side or the other. These are horses who actually do have something wrong going on and we have to find out what it could be. So first you can uh, help the horse and then the rider or the trainers. Uh, this horse actually had uh, moderate back pain, mostly at the level of the withers. The saddle fitting was good. The rider I think is good enough. It's uh, Eric Nave. for those who don't know him, it's. Uh, one guy who has been three times world champion, so maybe one of the best riders on the planet. And when it comes to jumping after blocking the withers, this is what we have. The horse is completely back to normal and jumping completely straight, as you see on the fence. So this is interesting because these are mild problems of horses that you can meet, which uh, are not a big deal for the vet because the horse is completely sound when you look at him on a straight line and circle. But when it comes to do his job, which is jumping, is not doing it properly. Um, this horse was six years old. We gave him uh, two months off. I did a small mesotherapy on his back. His muscling came back to normal. His pain went away and he started to jump straight again with no difficulties. So when it comes to this type of uh, problems again, this is another case of a horse. This is slow motion. So it will be, I guess, easy for you to see on your screen. That's a horse which is again completely sound on the exam. You look at him on a straight line, on a circle, on a hard ground, on a soft ground, you do hoof tests, you do board extension tests, everything is normal. The problem is these horses who have back problems or mild subclinical feet problem, for example, you will see it only when the horse is in a strange amount of load and exacerbated movement like the jumping. And this horse, as um, you can see, uh, will on the second fence, it's a horse who we started to block to find out what was wrong because he was completely sound, as I said. And we end up to block his feet and block his back. And this is what uh, we can get afterwards. So this horse changed his scope, changed his way of jumping by just doing a proper, uh, let's say, blocking of the two things which were suspicious to look at on the videos. So I can show you again quick this video, but look at the, the scope on the jump on this video compared to this video. So I will make a break on this one so you can see how much the horse extends. And you will see on this video how the horse scope is different. So just by blocking his feet and the fence obviously is also very different in terms of size. This jump is much higher than this one. So this is what we obtain uh, with this uh, particular case. When it comes to the, the horse physical exam, you have to remember that when it comes to counter performance, there's a lot of things that the rider will feel and the vet will not see. The best example I can give you is when uh, you check a horse, part of the examination in when the horse is cold, and most of the time this cold discomfort or these horses, for example, which are a bit fit sore, cold back, you will never see something wrong the horse is back to a uh, moderate uh, amount of work 
So when the rider is riding the horse and the horse does a bit more exercise and warms up, then you can see with the rider that there is um, maybe something that shows up to be different. And the reason why is because most of the exam we do as vets don't last more than 10, 15 minutes in a dynamic part of the exam. So things that you see could be coming up uh, as the horse warms up. But when the horse warms up, most of the times you are already in your car going to the next client. So this is something that I want you to evaluate as well. So it means somehow that you, if you can trust, obviously not every rider, you have to make sure that you can uh, do something in the meantime uh, that we can do uh, in terms of uh, follow-up and maybe look at the horse under tack to pick up more abnormal findings. And this is what is wrong also with most of our exam. And that's why also I respect a lot of my colleagues from uh, South America, because a bit like in France or in, uh, in uh, Spain or Italy, where I used to work a lot, we don't have all the toys. We don't have the MRI and we don't have all the bone scans right away. So you have to be good at observation. You have to be good with your clinical exam. And I have found a lot of colleagues who have too much tools and too much technology not being so confident with their clinical exam. The contrary is what I have seen when I went to Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and some other country where you live, where people have to be super careful with observation, try to get as much information as possible because we don't have bone scan every corner of the street. So you have to take into account your history of your horse, do a good palpation, try to find the type of lameness, the flexion test, the footing where you evaluate the horse, any joint abnormality, distension, uh, in hand, under tack, and then you can do your blocks and then you can think about some clinical conclusions. And what I like to do is to make sure that at the end of the first part of the exam, which is the horse standing, palpation, everything when it's cold, make a list of what I find, one, two, three or four findings, and then move on to the next step, which is looking at the horse moving. And maybe moving, you can find some interesting things which are in relation with what you have seen when the horse was standing. And therefore, you can use your dynamic exam almost like a complementary exam of what you found during the palpation. And this is super interesting because it helps you to be more accurate with what you palpate, the range of motion of the front limbs, hind limbs on a regular basis. Okay? So at this stage, when you get to imaging choices, you can make a, some uh, for sure decision with your clients not to pay for every x-ray, every scans of the horse, but you can find a few options to decide what they can uh, experience and what uh, treatment options obviously will come afterwards. So when you do a, a very thorough static clinical evaluation, you want to check the palpation of the back, the defect and the range of motion of the segment of the horse, some muscle loss and atrophy, muscle spasm, limb lameness that you can uh, note. And this is by just doing your physical examination. Examination. What is interesting, as, as you can see on this uh, small study that was done uh, in 2018, is that um, in 2006, people were doing much more um, diagnostic analgesia, checking their neurological examination, making sure that all the physical exam was very well done. And in 2016, a lot of vets, uh, it's the same for the human doctors. They don't touch you anymore. They don't palpate anymore. And a lot of things are just stayed backwards because they don't want to evaluate and do take time, do and take time of a physical exam. So I strongly recommend that if you are in this young generation, you try to make sure that you will have access to this uh, type of uh, strong uh, physical evaluation and make sure that you don't forget to take time to palpate the horse before you're jogging. Once the horse is jogged, when the horse is moving, your dynamic exam will unfortunately make disappear a lot of small back spasm, muscle spasm or muscle tension, and even the range of motion of every joint will change as you move forward. So continue to do a good thorough physical exam. When it comes to the type of palpation and evaluation, you look at the posture of the horse, the conformation. 
And some horses have very asymmetric back, like this horse that you see here on the top. I hope you can all see the very strange asymmetry between left and right. This horse has a chronic uh, tubercoxi and uh, tuber sacrale issue on his uh, helium wing on the right side. But, you know, with time, these horses sometimes function completely uh, symmetric, which is always a big deal because you would say that this horse is always lame. Uh, once the muslin is coming back to normal and you see that the muslin shape is actually quite good on right and left, this horse was very sound. This horse had a sudden amyotrophy of his right gluteus. And this horse had to have a sudden atrophy like this, something wrong, which is actually a nerve pinching and a nerve inflammation at the level of his facet L3, L4, L5. And we found an hematoma there of a horse who uh, was sitting in, uh, in his uh, stall. He maybe got injured, we don't know, but end up to have this strong amyotrophy in just 10 days. So when you have an amyotrophy that occurs to be very early on, it means that you have a neuronal or neurogenic problem as well. If this type of amyotrophy, like this horse here, happens to be within a few months, it's a misuse of the leg. So in this case, the primary problem should not be the back, it should be a lower limb issue, okay? So these are the things that you want to always look at to understand why a horse like this one as well does, as, does show, sorry, a significant amyotrophy and always ask the owner or rider uh, or trainer if this horse has lost muscle in a small amount of time or not. So when it comes to palpation, uh, I like to do first a superficial palpation by putting my hands on the top of the horse and check the fascia, the superficial muscles, and see if I have a strong density. You can also evaluate the skin and the succulent tissue because horses who have chronic spasm, the skin looks like it's sticking to the underlayer tissue, underlayer muscle. When you do your deep palpation, it also gives you an idea of the function of the lower structure, deeper structure, which are the core muscle, like the multifidus muscle, we will talk about it in a second. Also about the joints, so facets. And then you can look for any segmental focal uh, type of pain, which is sometimes interesting because the back, as you know, is the succession of segments, succession of vertebrae, which you want to be able to uh, squeeze one by one to see if there is one segment which is maybe more affected than the other. Uh, and that's very interesting because when you come to different section of the back, as you know, the main part of the motion is under the saddle, which is not making sense, I know, but most of the back here has a large disc uh, under the thoracic spine from T5 to T18, and the larger disc is around 11 and 12. Then you have, again, a joint which is very mobile, the thoracolumbar joint, because it's between T18 and L1, and then you have no more ribs, so there is uh, supposedly more lateral motion. And when it comes to the lumbar joints and facets, as you know, these facets are very um, uh, tight and close to the midline, so there is not so much possibility of movement laterally, but more movement in flexion or extension. Obviously, you have to check when the horse is cold or warmed up. When he's warmed up, this motion will change. And if it does not change, you know that you might have some joint disease. And it's actually a good diagnostic to make because if, if it's only the muscle which is not moving, when they warm up, most of the muscle, even us, we can still have a good type of motion. If this warming up does not change, you know that you may have some spinous process involvement, joint disease, or any other ligament and joint combined disease. So this is why I like to pick up the legs on the horse afterwards, because this lack of motion can give me an idea of how much the horse is happy to give his hind limbs. And you see, when you pick up the hind limb, you already start to make a pelvis test and a low back test. So never forget that when you pick up one leg, you're gonna create a torsion of the thoracolumbar space, the lumbosacral space, and the SI joints. At the same time, for sure, you are going to flex the hip, the stifle, the hock, and somehow the fetlock behind. So one test that I can show you here is a, is a woman who is doing 
a bit of a movement up and down on the tubercoxae. And this is a nice test to do to check the slide and the movement of the pelvis sideways. So it's a good combination between this test and this test to see how much, for example, sacroiliac and lobosacral movement you can get. When I do this test myself, I like to see and look at the hind limb. So look at my arrow here on the left hind, for example. If I do this test on the top, I want to see how much the horse is loading and changing the position of his fetlock down. Because if the horse fetlock does not drop, it means that he has also a rigidity or some stress and strain within the hook down or the suspensory apparatus because he will not change the position of his fetlock and it means that I may have some fibrous tissue or a pain when the horse has to load on his fetlock. So these are similar tests, but look, this horse, for example, I pick up the leg, I'm going to go slow to pick up uh, his hind leg. And when I pick up the hind leg, I should have progressively some movement of, um, of the pelvis. And some horses are very, very uh, difficult to pick up the leg and they will lean on you. They will put more weight on you as you go up. So if the horse is not happy with that, I let go and I go on the other side to see if the horse is changing. But this horse pelvis stayed completely straight, which means the horse was not happy for me to tweak and to rotate his pelvis. This is a very similar case. One of my associates tries to pick up the leg and the horse will not let him flex completely. Okay, and this is finally when you warm up and be gentle and progressive with the horse, get some movement and rotation of the pelvis. This one is very unhappy when you pick up the leg. Is going to lean completely on the vet and she tries to flex but the horse is not happy to do it and for sure she is not happy as well. So when I was coming back to this study look at the statistics it's very interesting to see that at the time when in 2006 people were looking at the horses and see if there was some back problem and back pain the difficulty on the ride and the resistance to work was seen by 96% of the vets and nowadays would be 78%. The modification of the jumping style and the poor performance were looked similarly, but always you see the percentage of the respondent in 2006 were much higher. And the reason why is because I guess, as I said before, in 2006 with less technology, most of the vets were looking at having more time for the physical exam and not looking too much at the technology, which means that today some vets, they are just maybe lazy or they don't do the job as we used to. And they are sending the horse for bone scan right away before they really find out what was wrong. And then what is your problem? You send the horse for a bone scan. OK, that's great. But if the result comes back and you have the, the horse bone scan, which is lightening up on certain areas which are not of your interest, if you have not done a good physical exam, you don't know if this uptake on the bone scans are always relevant or if they are. So again, your observation must lead you to make a list of suspicion. And if these suspicions are seen on your exam when the horse is jumping or when the horse is doing some polo or some uh, dressage, and then you see the bone scan and there is, for example, a uh, horse with a resistance when you do the pelvis flexion and movements and you have a strong uptake on the SI, yes, this is relevant. But if you have suddenly a hind fetlock or a low neck problem on the same side, what would you say? Is it relevant or not? For me, I still want to observe and make sure that what I see is relevant before I look at the images. So when you do a dynamic exam, as you know, there's a few things you don't want to miss. One of them is to do, on my opinion, the figure eight at the walk. The reason I like the figure eight is because the horse does not go too far away from you. You can see the cranial face, the caudal face of every stride. So as you remember, when you have a horse movement, first you have the cranial face of the stride with the front limb going away and forward to the body. And you have the stand face when it's perpendicular to the ground. And you have the caudal face when it goes behind this vertical line. And this caudal phase is also the propulsion phase. That's the moment where the, the toe is going to move away by pushing the rest of the body forward. So this is why it's called the propulsion phase. So 
When you look at these horses on a figure eight, you can see a nice, normally, angulation going forward, the loading face and the caudal face. So if one limb is not showing a nice pendulum movement, like a pendulum, you know, moving forward, backwards, then you can characterize the gait problem by being either a defect of caudal face, a defect of stand face, and a defect of caudal face. And that's how you can distinguish problems which are upper limb or lower limb. Most of the upper limb problems are a defect of cranial face. When you have a lower limb problem, most of the time you have a less caudal face, a lesser or not as good caudal face. For the front limb and for the hind limb, it's true. When you look at the horse on the circle, you, this is a slow motion, so don't check your video uh, trying to get it faster. It's normal, it's a slow motion. I like the horse to have a nice elevation of his back. The mid-back should go up and down. I like to see a nice stand face and caudal face of the stride of the four limbs. And because we look at the back problem and pelvis problem, I want to see the horse having this type of nice elevation over there. Look at the hind feet. They go off the ground. And what you can see as well is you have no dragging. A lot of horses who have back pain, pelvis pain, low back problem, they will have the hind feet which are grinding the ground. They just grind the toes, they don't elevate. So look at this other slow motion video focused on the hind feet and you will see that there is a dragging of the toe because the horse is not elevating his toes and they kind of come and kind of uh, follow the surface of the ground. Okay, so that's quite interesting. The other thing is uh, on the horses who do have uh, issues with the the trot on the, on the launch line, <clears throat> they will have a position with the launch line which is interesting. You look, let me look at this horse right now and you can look at this horse right there. So I make a break right there on this horse. Look at this position. It's completely oblique to the ground, a bit like a motorbike doing a turn to the right. Compared to this horse uh, over there that we will watch again. And if you look carefully, this horse will have a nice angulation with a launch line and it will be perpendicular to the ground. Okay, look at this. This is perpendicular to the ground. This is perpendicular to the launch line. This horse is not perpendicular to the ground, is leaning inside. The launch line is also shorter because this horse wants to go inside of the circle. This is the attitude on this chestnut horse of a typical low back, sacroiliac, lombosacral pain because the horse wants to do a smaller circle with the hind leg because he cannot extend his back and pelvis properly. This horse is sound for me. This horse is not sound and is unhappy with his hind back, hind part of his back. So when it comes to the bending of the horse, this is a summary of what I was telling you. A normal bending to the left, a horse with a dorsal pain which completely invert like a banana shape. So the head is outside, the butt is outside, and he leans inside, but only with his thoracic area. The lumbar and sacroiliac, they look similar because the horse head will go outside of the circle to balance, but the hind part of his body, the hind quarter, will go completely inside. So that's the way the horse will behave and move inside of his body. So this lombosacral and sacroiliac abnormality will show up on a circle with the head going inside with his butt. Sorry for the dogs, it's a lot of movement here. So when you have a horse moving on a circle to the left, for example here, this is a horse who has a hard time to collect his hind limb and flex his back. And this horse, you see, cannot go forward. So this horse has what we call a cold back. When he warms up, it's going to be a bit better. But if you look at this horse under tack and you don't ask the rider to trot right away, he will look almost normal. And this horse stayed at our clinic for one month. And I think it's very important for you to know that, again, if you look at the horse only cold, you cannot have the answer. If you look at the horse warmed up, then maybe you will find something wrong. This horse was suffering from strong arthrosis at the level of T18, L1, L2. And that's how he was moving when he was cold. But again, under tack, moving for 15 minutes at the walk and then picking up the trot would not be as bad as what you see on this video. 
So that's another test you can do is using the, the source single or the saddle. This horse has actually looking quite normal, okay, with a good stride, not a great motion of his back, but quite normal. This is the same horse with the girth, start to be a little bit sh shorter with his front end, okay. And now again, the same horse, but with a saddle and way, way shorter. Okay, so these are horses which are showing different uh, attitude because of how they look like with the, the source single or the saddle because they, they don't squeeze and don't push at the same level of the back. So if I have to make a guess when I look at these three videos, this horse has more thoracolumbar issue than thoracic issue because I think this horse is much worse with the saddle than he is with the source single. Okay, we want to watch again and have an idea of how this horse motion and movement is changing. He's actually lame with his left four when you look at these uh, videos far right with the saddle on his back. Okay. So this is again test with the source single. This is a horse who has a, a normal source single test. He does not mind. Maybe he's elevated his uh, head a bit more. It's actually a horse from the Chilean team. So you see, we have some South American horse on these videos. And uh, this horse was just, you know, trying to cope with the, 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 the source single not too bad. I don't like so much the head position, but I would say it's within acceptance. This horse for sure does not like at all my test and is completely freaking out, as you see, moving forward, elevating his neck, changing his back motion, and is completely uh, behind. This is a dressage horse that you see on a circle with a source single. So you always want to do this test on a soft surface if the horse really rears or falls down because it will be safer for him. And then you watch the same horse with a block that I have done at the level of the withers. This horse had kissing spine, we have seen afterwards. And for sure, once the, the spines are blocked with only 10 cc of lidocaine on both sides of the withers at the level where my palpation was the most evidently sore. So it was on this horse T14, T15. I injected with 10 ml of lidocaine and he ended up to have a very normal uh, canter on the launch line. If you do the blocks to prove that the source of pain is in the same area, you want to make sure that you don't warm up the horse too long. You go back to your clinic or to your stable you scrub right away, you block right away, and you go back on the launch line right away. The reason why is because these blocks tend to be very diffuse very quick. And if you wait too long, it will diffuse on the wall back and then you don't know which part has been really blocked. So between this video and this video, there is basically 10 minutes maximum because the time I came back to scrub and to inject the back with lidocaine. When it comes to the horse in competition or in the undertake, you can also do a few tests. If you have some riders, they like to share their videos, they want to show you what is wrong on the horse. You can always look at different videos and see which part of the back motion is not as good as it should be. And so it's important for you veterinarians to have a good knowledge of the horse discipline or what your rider is asking. Some other things you can see for sure is a concomitant uh, lameness with the back problem. If a horse is sore in his back and here on a, on a horse who has a chronic suspensory, you can see that the rider is sitting on the one diagonal, then change the diagonal and you get the horse much lamer again. And the reason why is because this horse has a concomitance of a suspensory problem with a back problem. So sitting on the wrong diagonal at the trot for this particular pony, made the lameness way more accurate. So the lameness is increased by the diagonal of the trot. And obviously because some back issues are also present on this particular case. Okay. So when it comes to the saddle, obviously you need to have some knowledge about the saddle fitness. This is a different, uh, let's say, part of the exam. I could spend hours to talk about saddles, but I think it's, uh, we can wait for some questions. The main deal is to have a saddle which loads evenly on the back. Unfortunately, you can do all the best saddle fitness you want without the rider. Once the rider is on, as you see, you can completely change the position of the pressure on the back. So 
you look at the saddle, it's one thing. You want to look at the saddle with the rider to have an idea of exactly where the load is maximized because unfortunately, this is something that might change depending on the level of the rider, the position of the rider. And if the rider has any problem himself, for sure it's going to change the pressure on the back of your horse. So what I also recommend, which is a very easy test for you and very cheap, I like a cheap test, so it's not expensive to do. You can take the saddle of the horse. Uh, you can wet the wall back with a sponge. You can put the saddle on the horse, the rider on the saddle, walk for 10 minutes, and then you take off the saddle and you see on the leather of the saddle what part has been more wet and what part is going to dry first. The reason why is because when it dries first, it means that there was maximum friction, maximum weight and load because the water will evaporate quicker where the maximum pressure was. So it's a cheap thermography. This is expensive. You can do the same as I told you with just a sponge by wetting the back of your horse and put the saddle on. So now it comes to something which I really like to do and people always make fun of me because the rectal palpation is going to give you a good idea of one muscle that you can really not palpate otherwise, which are the psoas. And when I do this test, I'm going to check the psoas pressure, tension, um, and you can palpate the psoas all the way forward where they insert. They insert very far forward, so it's no chance for you to have your arm long enough to go to T14, T15. But at least you will palpate the part of the psoas which are inserting caudally on the femur and on the pelvis wing. So that's interesting because this psoas muscle, as you know, are part of the core muscle and they are the main muscle to help the horse to flex his pelvis. So any work of collection, any work of movement to get the pelvis forward is only and mostly related to the iliopsoas muscle. At the same time, you can palpate the pelvis shape. You can palpate some of the nerve roots, sciatic femoral nerve roots. And if you have a mare, you can check the ovary glands and the uterus to make sure there is nothing wrong and painful, which could be interfering with any low back pain. The, I have always example of uh, mares which are very sore in their low back, which sometimes have bad season and painful in their ovary glands, sometimes a problem with ovulation or just chronic um, uterine infection. Um, I had a very good mare which was injected a couple of times in her back, never responded well on the long term, and this mare actually had a chronic uh, uterus infection that we cured and everything went back to normal. So don't ignore internal problems of your horse as well. When it comes to castration scar tissue, uh, I know a lot of uh, South American vets still do a castration standing or even uh, lying down, but you may have sometimes some scar tissue or some adhesions between the inguinal ring and the cremaster muscle. And these are super painful for the horse and they will mimic and they will look like horses who have some pelvis pain. Um, so, for me, there's always some place when you can look at the place where the horse can be sore. And if it's a lumbar axial skeleton problem, most of the time I made a list of things which are highly potentially the problem that you may face, which are epiaxial joint disease, so the little joints of the back. Uh, you can check the intertransverse joints and transverse processes of the back as well. And it could be only muscle soreness, like if you have a muscle tear or a muscle which is sore, like the gluteus, the multifidus, the psoas, these horses may behave uh, with a mild or difficult movement of their low back. Um, most of the ligament injury I see, but were, which are underdiagnosed, are the lesion of the supraspinous ligament um, on the top line. And finally, you may have all kinds of neuropathy. As I said, if you have a joint disease, uh, and you have the nerve roots which are close to the joint space, you will have some potential atrophy of the muscle and dysfunction of that particular muscle, uh, most of them being the multifidus and the um, gluteus muscle. So the, the, the clinical signs are always kind of the same. We spoke about it before. You have a defect of back extension on the jumps. You can have a frozen back. The horse may change lead in turns uh, with difficulties. Um, the defect of push 
for most of the rider is easy to feel and not always easy to catch for us veterinarians. So the defect of push is maybe the sign that most of the riders tell me um, is coming up. So when you look at the horse on the jump, it's also interesting to see that some of these horses don't want to extend very well the back. And that's a nice uh, schema from Jean-Marie that shows that if you have a thoracolumbar space or a lombosacral problem, these horses will continue to keep their uh, pelvis in a forward position with a contraction of the iliopsoas. So if they contract the iliopsoas, they will not extend the hind end. Okay, so if I come back to this video that you saw before on the slow motion, look at this horse over the jump. You expect the horse when it comes to be on the top of the fence to extend his hind legs over there, but he's not extending so much. And then you get this feeling that these horses can have a fourfold. Look at the closeness between the hind feet and the pole. So these horses are good candidates to have a lack of extension and potentially less scope to cover the fence and to create a potential four points on this part of the fence. Okay, so when you look at this, you understand very easily that the horse who has a chronic thoracolumbar problem or pelvis issue will not have the full extension and therefore will protect himself by contracting his psoas and abdominal muscle. This is a kind of the same scenario on horses in uh, Western performance, but I have the same on polo ponies. We underdiagnose this supraspinous ligament desmopathy. So these horses may have a thickening of the ligament that you see very well on the scan. They can have avulsion or chronic remodeling of the spinous process on the top. So that's easy to see either on X-ray or on ultrasound. On ultrasound, it's very easy to see because you will be seeing asymmetry and um, hypoechogenicity of the ligament within two spots or three spots between the spines. So don't look to always have a normal spinous process. Most of these ligament here are in between, in between the uh, spinous process. It's affect strongly the ligaments. So when it comes to um, the top line again here, you have a small details of some hypoechogenic finding, but this image you can get even with a rectal probe. You just need a linear probe to do this image. And I promise you, it's very shallow. You will be amazed by the number of findings that you may have on a horse who has a chronic back pain. Check always the supraspinous ligament. It's a very important ligament, which connect, as you know, with the gluteus and hamstring muscles for the horse to collect and be able to flex his pelvis with a nice contraction of his psoas and rectus abdominus muscle. When I have lesions like this here, the treatment is kind of easy to me. Uh, I like to do PRP injection and I like to do shock wave. And I follow these horses after three weeks, six weeks, and they do mostly lunge line during the rehabilitation. I for sure don't like to put a saddle and a rider on their back the time they are healing. So this is uh, another disease that is pretty common. Um, the apiaxial joint disease. The apiaxial joint disease, as you know, is a remodeling of the bone and the joint at the level of the facet. And we have tiny, tiny facet here on the top line. And uh, most of them are painful or having lesions from uh, T16 to L2, L3. Um, but it depends on the discipline a lot. Uh, you can see more thoracic problems on some race horses. And I see personally more uh, T16, 17, 18, L1 on short jumpers. So. It could be discipline related because it depends also of how flexible the back is supposed to be and how much range of motion you can get. But if you see on this horse, on the left side, you have a nice remodeling and bone spur at the level of these joints at L1, L2. And here on the right side, this, uh, this uh, facet is almost normal. And this is the facet joint space here. If you have a big spur on the outside, this is not the joint. This is the mammillary process, and this is normal. The joint is a bit within this part here, more internal. Okay, so you have a big spur there. The multifidus is a making like a triangle shape. And if it's well muscled, this multifidus can be almost like a, um, a sail of a boat. Look at the big yellow shape here. That's your multifidus shape. That's a nice multifidus, very well uh, muscled, let's say. This is on the top your uh, uh, gluteus and this is your longissimus muscle at the level of the lumbar facet. 
Okay, so this is easy to see. Like this horse here has a chronic uh, facet disease. He will invert, he will try to elevate his neck. These are horses which don't want to elevate their mid back. So when they canter, they look like a bastard, they look like a, a rocking horse. They don't want to elevate the back and they have a poor push of the hind end. When it comes, sorry, when it comes to the facet, look at these joints here, which are very uh, remodeled. So this is a specimen where you have a significant amount of facet remodeling. This is a normal facet. This is a very abnormal facet. So this one has a lot of bone changes, bone formation around the joints. This is a normal joint. This is a mid normal joint. This is a severe joint disease. So when you have a severe joint disease, like on this horse here, you have a huge amount of bone remodeling, which is seen very well on the scan. This is mild, but sometimes it's completely uh, making a big uh, shadow of bone and you cannot even see the facet. On the bone scan, they will light up. This horse will light up here at the level of the apaxial joints. This is more like a spinous process impingement. This is more like epiaxial joint disease, which creates uptake at the level of the facet uh, line. So this is interesting because you see on this facet, when they are not even remodeled, you have the joint space, but just behind that joint space, you have a nerve. And this nerve is coming from the foramen at the level of the back and the, 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 at the level of the vertebrae, sorry. And these two nerves, one is going to uh, give uh, innervation to the multifidus muscle, and one is coming very close to the facet joint. So these nerves are the one that you could also block when you do this type of injections at the base of the facet. And so be careful because when you inject this nerve, the horse can be much, much better. It might not last, but this is also significantly interesting for horses who have a lot of joint disease or foramen disease. So these nerve roots are very important and interesting to follow up uh, sometimes with your clinical exam or by blocking locally. Okay, this is a good article that you can find from uh, Jean-Michel van der Veerde from um, the University of, uh, of uh, Liège and uh, Francis de Bros as well. So it's always interesting to see that these innervations are uh, most mo more important than we think. And I think on the back, we, we always think only about the, the muscle and the joint of the back. And there is a lot of neuropathy which are behind this uh, type of pain. And finally, you have the multifidus, multifidus muscle disease, and this muscle inserts on the spinous process, so you can see here, and it will insert on the transverse processes, sideways, on the left and the right, and it can insert from one, two, three, four facet joints. So it's a very um, long muscle which attach very close to the spinous process. We call it a penate muscle because it's full of a lot of white fibers and it has a lot of proprioception fibers inside. And these proprioception fibers are responsible of the core and also the, the way the horse holds his back in space. So it, I think it's important to know for you that if you do have to work with these uh, multifidus problems, you will see on the scan, sometimes more echogenicity, more echogenic findings, and these echogenic findings are easy to catch again because they are very superficial. And this would be a normal muscle. This would be an abnormal one when you start to see some uh, lines in between. I will show you more pictures right there. Sorry, I just missed this one. But the, you will have more remodeling within the muscle. So the muscle will be not as strong and bulky like we saw before. So you will start to see instead of a convexity, you will see a concavity because this muscle by being affected, sorry, this muscle by being affected will show a different shape and it will be more echogenic and this function of core will be lost. So these are horses which are always painful in the back. You don't understand why, because they don't have a good core and a good, um, as you say, stabilization of the, of the back and the vertebrae. So when it comes to treatment and management of these joints, for sure you can do some guided injection or mesotherapy. The mesotherapy has a goal to relax the muscle all around the lesions that you have, because if you have a chronic joint disease like this one, it's nearly impossible that you don't have at the same time 
a strong muscle spasm. So you want to work on the muscle spasm and uh, make sure that your mesotherapy will also uh, help softening the muscle, as you know. And uh, therefore, you can start a follow-up and rehabilitation with control exercise, which I like to do on the launch line. I don't want the horse to jump too early, maybe 10, 15 days. If it's a polo horse, I don't want him to have a game before 10, 15 days. If it's a dressage horse, I don't want him to be ridden and collected too quick within 10, 15 days. The other therapy you can use to relax this muscle tension would be alternative therapies such as uh, uh, electrostimulation, shockwave, laser, but also you can have all kinds of manual therapy. So if you have a good uh, physio person or veterinarian who does a lot of physiotherapy and is involved with this, I think it's always good to create a nice teamwork around the back rehabilitation. When it comes to uh, guided injections, as you know, you can use your ultrasound and you can uh, put the needle for this facet, for example, in between your probe and the midline. And therefore, the needle will go down straight to get to the facet joint. And this area of injection is very interesting because you get very specific to put maybe some steroid or some IRAP or some PRP uh, inside of the joint or close to the joint when it's very remodeled. You know, you have to understand that when you have a lot of bone formation around, there is no chance you're going to go in the joint. Uh, you're going to create a periarticular anti-inflammatory effect, but you will not go into the joint. When it comes to the pelvis itself, so the sacroiliac lumbosacral area, you have a lot of things which could be painful. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to know which part is going to be the source of pain because all these structures, like on humans, are very close to each other. So on human beings, once you have a good questionnaire from your doctor, they will put you in an MRI, and after the MRI, they will say, oh, you know, it looks more like your disc, it looks more like your SI, it looks more like uh, your foramen, and then they can decide what they inject. So for sure, on the horses, we don't have the chance of this imaging. But again, it's about your physical exam. If you have been looking at all the physical exam I have proposed you before, it's just uh, uh, some keys, some, uh, some suspicion. But you can be more suspicious if you can look at these structures with your ultrasound or with a rectal ultrasound, as you know, it's a nice technique to evaluate the shape of the lumbosacral space, the shape of the foramen, the shape of the sacroiliac joints. And all these structures, most of the time, have abnormalities when they suffer. So, I tend, once I have made my clinical exam, to trust what I see on my ultrasound. If I have a bit of everything, for sure it's tough for me to make a decision. But if I have a very significant finding at the level of the sacroiliac or ilium wing or dorsal ligaments, then I make my choice for treatments and follow-up. So again, these horses, the clinical signs are the same. There's a stress on the pelvis. They will have a hard time to do a quick flexion and quick extension. So typically, these are the show jumpers which don't want to jump as high as before or don't push as good as before. It's typical of this uh, dressage horse who have a hard time to do a pirouette. It's typically the case of polo horses uh, for my Argentinian colleague who have a hard time to spin and go back on the other side. So they will take one more, two more seconds to turn around and go back to change the field. So these are these clinical signs that you know could be in relation with uh, chronic lumbosacral or pelvis pain. So I have a few examples of horses jumping. This one we have seen before. This is a horse, for example, who has a hard time to jump straight. So he jumps always to the right. Each time he jumps to the right, he has a hard time here on the slow motion to be going on the fence progressively. So you see that this horse is not doing the job properly. So what you see on this type of horses is uh, that they will try to change the direction and they will always go to the side where they have pain. So if a horse like this one here on this video has a right SI pain, he will jump to the right because the push of the right lead will be worse and he will shift his whole body on the side of pain. So that's why I like to look at these videos and compare if the lead and the change of lead will be important for me to make my diagnostic. Okay. So when it comes to um, a horse who has a chronic SI, that's a case of a horse here, which is 
doing good. This horse will jump straight and have a good collection in between the two fans. And he stays pretty alert. Look at the same combination, the same day with another horse. There was a flat jump, four fold, and again four, four fold on the second jump. And if you look carefully in between the two fans, this horse, when he starts to connect, is again having a hard time to come back. So his head is up, the rider tried to had stride, the hogs are behind, the pelvis is not flexed. This horse will have to change the number of strides in between the two fans and obviously does not take off from the right position. When it comes to dressage, you, when you look at the pirouette or when you look at the horse from the side, the dissociation, the dissociation, which means the space between the two hind limbs will not be the same. The horse will not have his two legs very well spaced and they will sometimes be together, which means that when you look at the horse, it looks like a rabbit who takes off at the same time for both hind legs. So this is typical of horses who have pain in the rear, pain in the butt, pain in the pelvis, and they will not dissociate well the two hind legs. So the bone scan on this sacroiliac joint problem are quite helpful because they really show up a hot spot, sometimes more diffuse around the outside of the pelvis wing, and more typically exactly in the axis of the SI, which is a little bit more outside. So that's why on these images, we like also to do oblique views uh, with the gamma camera for those who have a, a bone scan or read bone scans to see if this uptake is more lateral or medial. But as I told you, I, am, I don't always need the bone scan. If I have a clinical exam, which is super suspicious about uh, SI problems, uh, I also can use my scan. So you, the scan from the top line is only helpful for me to check the wing shape and obviously stress fracture or acute fractures and follow up this type of lesion. So this is very typical, uh, but these horses, they are not just counterperforming, they are really lame, as you know. If it's a chronic fracture, they can be uh, counterperforming, but first you will see this horse is very lame, so you will not miss uh, ilium wing fracture within bone scan if you have one, but also with the uh, ultrasound system. It's very easy to find. Um, but this is a case which is interesting. It's a horse which was seen for a pre-purchase exam. And believe it or not, he was, as you see, very short behind, almost lame. His lame right hind, as you see, with the rider um, on his back. It's not very convincing, but you know, you could test the hawk and, uh, and a couple of things. This horse had a bone scan and ended up to have a mild stress fracture on the right ilium. So it's interesting to see that some horses may have, as I said, a mild discomfort and still show some very odd findings. But this one, I would say that wouldn't, I would not be able myself to make a diagnostic without the bone scan. When it comes to the pelvis, the good news is we can have this transrectal exam. And the imaging, which is the most helpful, is this technique that Jean-Marie Denois has been describing, where you can put your probe inside of the rectum. And instead of looking at the ovary glands from the side, you can look at the top line and look at the pelvis and disc and foramen of the main last two or three vertebrae. So here on this image, when I put my probe underneath, I can see the lombosacral space and the disc. So this is S1 here. This is L6 over there. And in between, for sure, I have the small disc of L5. So small disc for L5, L6, big disc for L6, S1. So this is something you can do with your rectal probe very easily. So even if you do only reproduction work with only a rectal probe, you can do this exam very well. And these are uh, some findings. There's a bunch of examples, but this is a small disc between L5 and L6 within normal. And here it's a collapsus of L6S1. So you don't see the disc anymore. You have a black gap because the disc is actually completely collapsed between L6 and S1. And so L6 and X1 are, <coughs> excuse me, fused. So this is now the projection of putting the probe on the foramen on the left and the right side. What you see on the image now is a small cup like this, and this cup is the foramen just there. This foramen gives you an idea of the shape of the nerve also which emerge from this foramen. 
And at the level of L6-S1, this root is one of the three sciatic nerve roots. The sciatic nerve root emerged from L5, L6, L6-S1, S1, S2, and you can have an idea of the shape of the nerve and you can have an idea of the intertransverse joint. So this tiny joint, which is just in front here, and this joint is basically the limit between L6 transverse process and S1 transverse process. So this is why we call it intertransverse joint, because we have two transverse process with a joint in between. And this joint can be pinched or can be fused as well, because then if you have less motion of this joint, you can imagine easily, if it's sometimes completely fused, that the L6-S1 movement will be not able to be done. Therefore, the horse will be having a lack of flexion of his lower pelvis. This is a case where the foramen was showing a spur. So instead of having a big, nice foramen here, I have a piece of bone which is coming from the intertransverse joint and which obturate progressively the foramen size. So these horses, you can see sometimes these spurs and I can see them on the scan. They will obturate and pinch the root of the sciatic nerve. So you can imagine that these horses could have the clinical signs of a sciatic pain like on human beings. And for them, it's a very strong pain. They warm up from it like humans, but when they are cold and we are not pushing off the ground, um, this part of the sciatic nerve being pinched, it could be a very painful condition. And so we inject them from the top, uh, the level of the lumbosacral space. So it's a bit like a sacroiliac joint, I will show you, but you will inject uh, a bit more close to the midline. So again, these sciatic nerve roots, this time I can see them from the side, it's a bit more technical this time, but these are a nice specimen to show you the share of the nerve roots. So this is your sciatic nerve, and it's coming from L5, L6, S1, S2. So these are the three emergence roots which converge to make the sciatic nerve root. It's a nice paper that we have uh, done with uh, one of my interns, Pablo Espinoza, and uh, is, um, is from Spain. And we did this, uh, this uh, necropsy in, um, in France and in uh, uh, USA to get uh, a full amount of horses with a total of 28 where we could see if there was some variation of the nerve root and uh, the foramen size. So it's interesting because you can measure that with your ultrasound. You don't need to dissect the horse each time, which is good news for the horses. Anyway, coming to the next step is also some survey about uh, equine practitioners. When I ask these uh, practitioners uh, what they think about the horse who drift on a jump, most of the time I get a front clip related pain on the same side. And the second uh, most finding is the SI, so sacroiliac joint issues. And the main reason for them to have a defect of push is the SI joints again, but this time first place 50%, stifle 30% and hogs 20%. So these are very raw numbers, but I wanted to share that with you because it means that if you have a horse with a defect of push and you continue to inject only the hogs or the stifle, you might make uh, some of these horses not happy enough to jump the best again. So if you start to be good at finding this SI joint or lumbosacral joint disease and you can inject them properly, you will see a big change in the push and obviously you will make your uh, horse and client happier. So I can only emphasize that part. The other study that we did in our clinic uh, a long time ago, it's almost 10 years now, um, it's actually 15 years now, it was uh, interesting because I asked one of my residents to look at all the horses we injected and the one which were very well documented because we, we did mostly 12,000 horses injection of SI um, in 2000 up to 2020, uh, sorry, at the time it was 2008. So in eight years, we did 12,000 horses, but we only had 135 cases where we had a full follow-up, including some bone scans and everything. So I wanted to keep only these 135 cases. And we find out that these horses related pathologies were chronic hind suspensory problems and medial stifle compartment distension. So when you have a horse who has a chronic stifle distension, but is not so lame, but has a defect of push, look at the SI. If you have a horse who has a chronic suspensory behind, 
try to look at the sacroiliac joint or lumbosacral joint because these horses will abnormally weight on their suspensories. And so it could be chicken or egg. You can have both problems at the same time. But I think if you treat only the suspensory or only the SI, you might not have the best result. You have to think about looking at the cause of a chronic suspensory or the cause of a chronic SI. So that's where I really like this study because it opens our eyes a little bit about concomitant problems with the pelvis issues. So uh, this would be some other example of how you look at the SI, but when your horse has a chronic SI, the other thing you can see is horses which are pacing inside. So they are coming with a hind limb really inside of the track. And these are the five or six findings which we find the most, which are tracking narrow behind. They do um, a lateral walk, so they, they go sideways. The haunches don't go in and out properly, but this is we, we discussed already on a, on a circle. They can have an asymmetric tail position. When they canter, they can have this bunny hop, so the rabbit type of canter we spoke on the horse doing pirouettes. And obviously, they have a reduced flexibility of the lombosacral space. So when I come back to the SI joint here, we can see some images of where I place the probe. So the probe will go outside of the midline to the left to look at the left side and to the right. And this is your sacroiliac joint here. So my rectal probe will be going sideways to evaluate this joint. And I don't say it's a very easy ultrasound to do, but if you, if you train and you look at this image, this would be your ilium wing. This should be your sacrum. And so in between, you have the sacroiliac joint. So look at this small schema here, and you can understand a bit better what you see on the top of this image there. So this is not always easy to get, I agree, but um, you will look at these different findings. And when you have changes of the sacroiliac joint, you will have some spurs on the top. You will have some remodeling at the base. So this one, for example, is a nice joint. This one is very remodeled. You have uh, spurs. I cannot see the joint space anymore. The helium wing disappears. It's very flaky at the base. This one is even worse. You see a lot of small uh, line, like the tile of a roof. And all these small lines are small spurs, osteophytosis, coming from the sacrum towards the helium. And these are findings of a chronic sacroiliac. Here is the same, a bit less easy to catch, but this one is very obvious, okay? So when it comes to injections, for those who have been injecting a site before, you just go oblique under the wing. This is what we call the classic blind sacroiliac injection. You go under the wing and you aim to go somewhere there, which is a sacroiliac. You can guide your needle under the wing with the ultrasound. And when you do lombosacral injection, you can go parallel, parallel to the line here, parallel to the midline, approximately four or five centimeters away and your needle will go again under the wing and aim for the lumbosacral space. So this is where your needle will be, next to the foramen, next to the intertransverse joints, and your product will, will fill the gap. When you inject, for example, 5 cc, this is what I do. I take a syringe with 10 cc of pre-def, 10 cc of saline. I mix together, this makes 20 cc, and I inject 5 cc here, 5 cc on the right, and then I go codally five and five. So that's 20 cc all together to inject the sacroiliac. And uh, it's not a difficult injection to do if you know how to use your ultrasound, but the idea, as I said again, is to make your needle go under the wing and hit bone, find bone with your needle, the tip of your needle to inject either the foramen here close to the lumbosacral space or the SI. When it comes to finding the codal aspect of the SI joint, I give you a trick here. Um, there's different methods. There's actually two methods. There's one that Jean-Marie Donois described, which is a bit more anatomic, but I think more difficult to find. For me, I follow with my probe parallel to the midline. So I am five centimeters away from the midline with my probe. And I follow this line of the croup and I slide my probe, excuse me, I follow my probe progressively. So these are the spots that you see here. I will maybe send you a copy of this slide for you if you want to find the sacroiliac joint, but it's easy to see that you will follow the wing, follow the wing, follow the wing. And when you, the wing suddenly disappears, so you get at the caudal aspect of the wing, you're going to get a gap here. 
And this gap is giving you the caudal ilium part of the wing. And the base line here, this line that you see is the sacrum. If you go too much away from the midline, the sacrum will move because it's not the sacrum anymore, it's the rectum. If it's not moving, if it's nice and flat, this is your sacrum. So this small spot here, this junction between the two is the sacroiliac joint, the caudal sacroiliac joint. Okay, so this is where you will inject. You will have your cranial approach, your needle will go under the wing, and you will have your caudal approach, and your needle will be just behind the helium wing here. It will come all the way. And this technique is nice because you see your needle all the way within the sacroiliac joint. And a lot of studies have been made with latex or with methylene blue, and we, proven, we have proven that this a technique is nice because it really goes within the joint easily. We have a small video to show you that you can put follow the needle, follow the, the wing first, sorry. This is your sacrum, this is your ilium, and the needle will come from behind, okay, because I, my probe is there. The needle comes from behind. We will adjust, this is your base of your sacrum over there, so we will adjust the image a little bit more. So I hope you see the video well. And this is your ilium wing, this is your sacrum. You see the movement underneath, this is your rectum. So you don't want to inject there. You want to inject just here at the base, okay? And your needle will come just at the level of the sacroiliac joint, caudally. I'm sorry, it takes some time, but you'll see the needle arrive here. There we go. The needle just will aim to the edge, caudal edge of the SI here. Okay, I don't go here. This is a rectum. You don't want to go there. Okay. Anyway, one other pathology we can talk about are the psoas problems. The psoas inserts, as I said, on the femur and the pelvis wing. So you may have tendon issue of the psoas. Like on human beings, the psoas pain is huge when the, you have a tendinopathy. And if you have a disruption or a chronic tendinopathy, these horses will not be happy to collect and flex for the same reason as I said before. So we don't want to have that. So unfortunately, it's only a diagnostic you can make by palpation and ultrasound uh, rectally. When it comes to the last type of injection I wanted to show you are the psoas injection. These injections are interesting because you are not obliged to go in the psoas themselves. You can stay on the top of the psoas or you can be in between two transverse spines. The needle will go straight down vertical down and to tip and fill the bone on the transverse process. So your needle does not go all the way into the psoas, all right? And you just see my, my point here. I can put the video again. This is the midline on my finger. This is four or five centimeters away from the midline. My needle goes all the way and I feel bone. I am feeling bone here and I inject the psoas from the from this part. It's important to inject the psoas when the horse has a chronic pain of the pelvis, or even if it does not have any, because the psoas need to be released for the horse to extend and collect better again. Okay. Finally, two uh, type of uh, problems that you can get which involve the pelvis, which is the coxofemoral joint. The horse coxofemoral joint, as you know, is a very deep joint. Um, this is the videos that uh, I have taken with my wife, where you see that the horse has a problem to do a nice uh, round shape with his right hind compared to the left hind. So this horse had on his right hind a severe capsulitis and inflammation of the coxofemoral joint compared to the left, which was very smooth and have a nice shape. So when you have the chance to see these horses who have a hard time to describe a circle with the hind leg uh, properly, you can suspect that they can have some coxofemoral pain. So this horse obviously was examined cold. Then I scanned it, I compared left and right, and this is what he was showing. On this video, if you see the video well, I hope this is a horse who had a chronic sacroiliac and coxofemoral, but he was lame. And when the horse is lame, I don't think immediately about sacroiliac, I think about the joint problem. And when I blocked him, he was much better on his right hand. So hopefully you can see the videos, but um, these horses respond very well to the block and I block ultrasound guided my needle all the way to 
the coxal femoral joint and I inject 10 cc of carbocaine or lidocaine. So when it comes to the coxal femoral joint, I can show you the technique very quick. I put my probe from behind. So this is the image you get. This is the, the head of the femur. This is the neck of the femur. And this is your coxal femoral joint just there. So it's a bit more here this way. And then I will put, um, I'm sorry, I will put my needle under the probe and guide the needle all the way. So the needle, I'm sorry again, the needle will slide under the probe and go directly into the coxal femoral joint. Okay, so if you want to look more carefully, again, coxal femoral joint, the neck of the femur, the head of the trochanter, it will go directly there. Okay, that's your edge of the pelvis. So this is the pelvis, head of the femur, obviously femoral coxal joint just there. Okay, so not so difficult to do if you take the time to place your probe. And if you have a horse that you have a strong suspicion, maybe you don't block, you just inject right away. I know some people cannot block and come back because you have a lot of uh, road to do. Ideally, I like to do both at a time, but you can block and inject the same day otherwise. And so you don't have to come back to check this horse again. So the follow-up treatment, as you know, is using different drugs. Um, I am not a fan of using always steroids on all these horses. So normally I treat them with some uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, which could be uh, non-steroidal, but for the psoas and for the muscle pain, it's always better to use mostly DEX or uh, flumetazone. I don't know if in South America you can find flumetazone anymore, but in USA and in uh, Europe, it's tough to find now. And uh, more and more, I use PRP, I use PPP, and we can discuss this a bit later when you have questions because I have really good uh, results. For sure, all the rehabilitation that you may use with um, control exercise, laser, shockwave, functional electrostimulation are very good uh, product to use. And again, I can keep this for the discussion after this uh, lecture. Okay, so just to show you the last uh, slides of what we can do now in the future, this is a uh, video that we have done at home. I'm sorry, I just want to check that again. Uh, these uh, are, we are using motion capture video nowadays and we use a bunch of cameras to check the motion of the back, the motion of the hind legs and for sure this might be the future. Um, I, am, I am happy that we, we have this system now to, to use at home but it's uh, a bit too much of a high end but when it comes to counter performance this is really the way to be objective with uh, the findings because otherwise the riders they can push you to do some things that you don't see and uh, you end up to inject uh, very, you know, um, random stuff on the horse and I don't think it's the way to go. Uh, I like to get a bit more science credit, but you know, you, you are still there to please your horses, please your clients. So we end up to, to do sometimes strange type of injection. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. And that's why I want to be as always a bit more specific and accurate with what to do. So the conclusion is, Again, the clinical exam is amazingly paramount. If you don't do a good clinical exam, if you don't have the technology, you will not go any far. And that's why I think the back and the pelvis is super interesting for us and especially for you who are uh, clinicians before being uh, doing too much imaging. And that's why I tell you there's a big difference what, in what I see in North America and what I can see in South America where people are trusting their hands more than the imaging and the technology. So. I just can uh, emphasize one more time that uh, it's important for you to develop your anatomy skills, develop your biomechanic findings, uh, try to understand the type of segmental pain. You have to be good in neurology. You have to be good at knowing the discipline of your rider so you can understand these uh, counter performance issues. Okay, so I am done for today, or at least for the 